Hello, I'm Thomas Hare, Chief Content Officer of the Performance Driven Marketing Institute, a not-for-profit trade association that serves companies in the performance and direct-to-consumer marketing world. Welcome to the third event in our winter seminar series, today created by the PDMI's Women's Leadership Council, the future of advertising and risk mitigation. We welcome all of you to today's event, PDMI members and non-members alike. If you're not a PDMI member but are attending today, we'd love to have you consider joining the association. There's no better way to support the mission of the PDMI than joining and sharing your voice in the direction of the industry. In the handouts tab of your control panel, you'll find our PDMI membership brochure. I urge you to download it, flip through it, and contact any of our team members should you desire more information. One more housekeeping note, the group will be addressing any questions from the audience at the end of today's session, but you don't have to wait to ask them. Utilize the questions tab on your control panel to type and send your question in. We'll be collecting them and we'll try to get to as many as possible in the final moments of the webinar. You know, technology is revolutionizing the advertising business at an accelerated pace. From generative AI to Web 3.0 and innovative ad tracking technologies, advertisers are finding new ways to create content, create and track audiences, and hyper-personalize their advertising down to an individual level. Today's conversation will present a deep dive into what these new technologies are, how marketers are already using them, and how to minimize the legal risks associated with this evolving landscape. We welcome today's group. Linda Goldstein and Sarah Lavoy are partners at Baker Hosteller, and Lee Zeiser uh, is senior manager of Baker Hosteller's Incubator team that has been at the forefront of helping businesses adapt to emerging and transformative technologies for an inside look at what the future of advertising looks like and practical solutions for minimizing risk. We hope to be joined soon as well by Nicole Sterling of Baker Hosteller. With that, Linda, let's get it started. Take it away. Thanks, Tom. and, and um... Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I will say that uh, since this session is being sponsored by the Women's Leadership Council, and this is Women's History Month, uh, I'm beyond thrilled to be joined on this panel by three of my most powerhouse colleagues. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, both Sarah and Lee, and I promise Nicole will be joining us to just take a moment to introduce themselves and uh, tell you a little bit about what they do here. Sure, um, well, thank you so much, Linda, and thanks for suggesting this. I'm excited to be here too with PDMI. Um, I'm a partner in the Chicago office of Baker Hostetler. I'm still getting used to saying that because I spent many years as in-house legal, um, really shoulder to shoulder with um, the creators, the business people, um, at, at an ad agency, um, a few of them actually. Um, but I transitioned back and, and took that practical experience to Baker Hostetler um, and love working with Linda, Lee, and Nicole. I'll jump in next, Sarah, thanks so much. I'm Lee Zeiser, I'm Senior Manager of Innovation at Baker Hostetler out of Cincinnati, Ohio. And I am part of a group called Incubaker which is really a fusion team of technologists and non-practicing attorneys like myself that are working hand in hand with our council teams to operationalize legal process and guidance for our clients. Uh, I am the uh, International Legal Technology Association 2022 Innovator of the Year. And with that, I'll hand it to Nicole. Hi, everybody. Uh, Nicole Sterling. I am a partner in New York, in our New York office. Um, I'm part of our digital assets and data management practice, and I focus primarily on privacy compliance um, and the ways that it intersects with all sorts of other things like AI and advertising. Thanks. And I think, as most of you know, I'm Linda Goldstein. I'm a partner uh, and uh, part of the advertising, marketing, and digital media team here at Baker, and as 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 Tom said, uh, what we hope to do in this presentation, I mean, we're all seeing it in our practice that technology has really revolutionized um, the way brands and marketers and service providers are 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 all engaging in advertising and marketing practices or providing support services. And you might be thinking, what do a bunch of lawyers know about all this technology? And uh, we've had to become quickly educated because as the technology has evolved and, and integrated itself ever more so into advertising and marketing, we've had to learn about the technology, but also anticipate, manage, and try to mitigate many of the risks that have come along with some of this very, very wonderful technology. And I think the first place um, 
to start would be with AI. Um, this is just one quote I thought that really captured it, uh, that AI is probably going to be the single biggest disruptor and enabler of marketing in total. It's a dream come true from a marketer's perspective, and I won't say this yet, but it could be a little bit of a nightmare for lawyers. Um, but let me start, and I'm going to turn it over to Lee, just to give at a very high level, um, what is generative AI? And hopefully this will be the easiest to digest explanation you've ever heard. Take it, take it away, Lee. Thanks, Linda. So it's helpful to think about what is AI first. AI is really an umbrella term for technology that solves problems by simulating human intelligence. So a great example of this was the chess playing computer Deep Blue from IBM that back in 1997 was beating chess grandmasters. And now that same kind of technology, of course, powers things like Siri and Alexa. There are various other branches within artificial intelligence and, you know, under that umbrella, uh, including machine learning, which is used for things like weather forecasting, analyzing historical data in order to make predictions, and then deep learning, which if you've ever seen the brain images with, they're representing uh, neural networks where huge amounts of data are processed so that advanced technology can operate autonomously. And you could think of something like a self-driving car for that example. Generative AI then is a language model, a language model that exists for the purpose of creating a, a new original content output, uh, looking at different patterns within the language to uh, produce what it thinks you're looking for from a broad set of content. That's really distinct from ChatGPT, which is a product. It's really important to understand that ChatGPT is just one application of generative AI. There are really hundreds at this point. So AI has been around for a long time, but why is Gen AI getting so much attention now? Yeah, so I have a what I think will be great from an advertising standpoint here, uh, a graph to take a look at. These figures will really help you understand the fact why generative AI is getting so much attention is because ChatGPT launched into the marketplace and reached a million users in just five days. Well, it took providers like Facebook 10 months of exposure to hit that level of exposure in the marketplace. And it is, of course, predicted that in the next 12 to 18 months, we will see even more disruptive potential from generative AI. And um, Nicole, Sarah, anything else you want to add before we move into how Gen AI actually works? I mean, I always like to encourage people to try it. I feel like we do so much talking about it, but, you know, Download, download one of the apps. Give it a try. I think it's really important to learn. And there's, there are a lot of apps out there that you can play with now, and they're starting to do really interesting things. So now we're starting to get these sort of multimodal systems where you can, it'll look at text and recording and images all at the same time rather than needing to run them through different systems. And I think that some of the ways in which we are seeing refinement um, of things like ChatGPT and and its capabilities are, are really interesting and will continue to be interesting this year and next year. And, and we're, gonna, we're gonna get into um, in much more depth how specifically Gen AI is being used for different types of advertising and marketing um, purposes. But before we go there, um, again, Lee, could you just talk a little bit generally at a high level about how it actually works? Absolutely, Linda. So I think the key thing to know is that generative AI is working off of a probabilistic model. So probability. A lot of us went to law school because math wasn't maybe our favorite thing. Um, so I am going to keep this super high level. If you see in the uh, lavender graph at the top, um, you can imagine that a language model was trained on a data set that said the car drove into the drive through the majority of the time, right? It, it, drive versus parking is a higher value 
and way versus through, um, oh, excuse me, drive way, way, way versus through is a higher value. So if the data says the car drove into the driveway most of the time, then if you have a prompt asking where the car drove, it's most likely to tell you it drove into the driveway. But if in that data set, it actually said that the car drove into the parking garage when it was raining most of the time, and your prompt talks about the fact that it's raining in this scenario, then it may instead use the probabilistic analysis to say that your car drove into the parking garage. So that's one component of how this works under the hood. The other component is uh, that it's using natural language processing, which really is a fancy way of saying that it understands grammar, it understands the syntax of your sentence. So if you say the dog laid on a couch, which was white, then generative AI can understand that you mean the couch was white, not the dog, even without this really cute picture of a dog to take a look at. And so now, um, Nicole, let's let's drill down a little bit more. And um, from a very practical standpoint, what are some of the things that AI can actually do for us? Yeah, so the sort of generative AI is great because I think as Lee has mentioned, it's like you can ask it things in your in your normal whatever language you would like to, however you want to phrase a question, you can ask it that. So it is able to answer those questions. It can classify or organize things. You can ask it for things like um, uh, last summer, for instance, I decided to ask ChatGPT what I should do with a day trip from Madrid um, and to bullet point that out. So it gave me a whole itinerary of exactly what I should do. Um, it can generate text. It can give you images, video, uh, code, um, all sorts of things along those lines. Uh, it can do audio now. Different things can be able to produce audio that, that mimics people very closely. This is why we're seeing a lot of concern in that space around both audio, uh, audio video, and images uh, because of the ways in which they're very lifelike. And then it can summarize. It can do data analytics. It can do translation, um, really a more seamless experience with translation. If you try it for that, it's kind of it's kind of interesting because you can input something and ask for the output to be in a foreign language, um, which is also quite useful for some people. So lots of ways in which it can be used. And I think we are just sort of starting to tap the potential of what these outputs uh, from AI can be. Yeah, and I, I would say, and you, you, you're going to see as we move next to how brands actually are using it. A lot of this has already been in use in things like massive email marketing campaigns or targeted marketing. Um, but now brands are really beginning to use it in some very different ways. And Sarah, you've been you're working with lots of brands, lots of agencies. What have you seen so far? Yeah, um, so brands, brands are using this, um, you know, both internally for sort of corporate functions just like any company could. So to Nicole's point, summarizing big chunks of text um, and trying to pull out those nuggets so it's a little bit more manageable. Um, they are also, you know, from a creative perspective, definitely using it to generate ideas, right? You can, you can put an idea into it and get another idea and then another idea and refine that. So when you're in that, early brainstorming process, um, Gen AI really allows you to brainstorm by yourself, <laughs> but really well with the tool. Um, and then taking that a step farther, copywriting, refining copywriting, looking at different options. Let's say you had your heart set on a, on a tagline, you ran it through your trademark search, it wasn't gonna work. Um, you could ask a Gen AI tool for alternatives, um, perhaps faster than, than a brain will get there right? At least a human brain. Um, other, um, other points too. I mean, I've seen, I have seen this, um, virtual models. That's another big one. I know we've, we've talked about that a lot internally. So basically using it for creative imagery, 
Yeah, and I'll just add, and we're going to get into some of these. It's super, it can be super, super useful for personalization. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about how Gen AI will really open the floodgates to hyper personalization. Uh, it's already been in use for a number of years in connection with chatbots, and that's created some issues that we're going to delve into. But I wanted to take a few minutes um, to just share with you some actual examples of how some major brands um, have already harnessed the power of Gen AI. Um, this, this first one uh, that I'm going to show you is um, a campaign that Coca-Cola put together. And basically what they did is they fused live action together with um, lots of um, Gen AI created images really to create a viewing experience that with without that combination, um, I'm I'm not sure they could have created in a in an in a in an affordable campaign. So let's take a look. <laughs> So as you can see, some of it was live action. You may not even be able to tell which was which. And then they kind of were able to bring these pieces of artwork to action. Of course, if you're sitting there thinking, wow, that looks great. I'm going to do this myself. We'll talk about copyright and uh, ownership shortly. But obviously, you would have, the, have to have the rights to pull that artwork into your campaign. Um, the next one I'm going to show you is I, I just, I think, a really fascinating one talking about, you know, sort of the prompts and then the output. And this is one where Heinz almost innocently wanted to get a sense of how consumer, what, cons, you know, sort of the perception of ketchup is. So they basically used um, AI's Dolly 2 to create a series of ketchup inspired images and they basically asked them to generate images inspired by ketchup and here's what they got So I apologize that the sound isn't going there, but it basically confirmed for them, certainly um, massaging their ego, that even AI knows that Heinz is synonymous with ketchup. And this last one is an example of hyper personalization. In this one, um, uh, it, the um, car van, which um, is another way of purchasing Carvana, rather, is a sort of a disruptive way of purchasing cars. In order to thank their customers, they actually created these unique videos for every one of their customers sort of documenting the day, the time, the, the car they bought, and sort of putting it into a memory context and take a look. I'm calling Deborah for you today we met. I was so excited. It was August 27, 2020. Everyone was obsessed with tigers. Wow. It was International Pottery Day. Cool. The people are enjoying their final days of summer vacation, and you and I were both in South Burlington, Vermont. Gosh, we were just kids then. That was a wide eyed and innocent 2018 red Tesla Model 3. And they had just told me the name of the new owner, Peter. Um, so. As you can see, there are lots of interesting ways brands are beginning to use um, Gen AI. Another one um, 
maybe because uh, brands think it's cheaper or they're easier to control is the use of AI for computer generated influencers. Sarah, can you talk to us a little about what's happening there and what some of the issues are? Sure, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, it has been coming up a lot. So there are hyper-realistic influencers out there who are not human, who are, who are woven into the influencer environment. If I was scrolling, I would see these faces and I have to tell you, I would think that they were I'm almost superhumanly beautiful <laughs> influencers. But to me, to my eyes, I would not know that they were computer generated virtual influencers. I will say to my teen and tween, uh, they, they claim to know immediately. So maybe their eyes are in fact sharper. But these, these human-like influencers, everyone that I'm aware of, they do disclose the fact that they are AI generated. They're not trying to hide it. That is part of the hook and part of the fun. And brands are going ahead and engaging them just like they would another influencer. They'll contract with the entity that controls the character and schedule some type of a promotion that way. Now, you also asked me about some risks related to that. The rewards, and you mentioned this, Linda, I, I think that you can probably get some value there depending on that particular influencer's reach and followers. It's got really good demographics um, to share. So, the, you know, you can see the cost, you can see the value. Also, a really practical point, you can pre-schedule like you would with any type of social post on your own channel almost. You can pre-schedule it, you can review it, you can approve it, you can ensure that all of the important disclosures are there from the material connection perspective, like hashtag ad, where I think there's some risks, it, it really goes back to basics in terms of brand reputation and is this the right fit? Anytime a brand hires an influencer or anyone to endorse their products or anything here, they need to do that analysis up front and decide, is this a good fit generally? And with a virtual influencer, they need to think that through even more carefully and say, is this a good fit for us now in this way and with our products and services? You wanna make sure that a virtual influencer is the right vehicle to be making any claims, for example. You need to be very, very mindful about product claims if the virtual influencer cannot in fact really experience your product. I, I've seen it work really well in fashion, and very visual things. It, For example, I'd be reluctant to engage a virtual influencer to post about and talk about the feel of a, of a skin cream, for example. Yeah, or, or similar. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest um, things to keep in mind if you're, if you're gonna go for a artificial influencer, you know, other than something that, you know, really isn't all that material, like look how nice this dress looks on me. They can't talk about how the, you know, the shampoo thickened their hair or the skincare eliminated lines and wrinkles. I mean, they, it, it, again, going back to basics, the FTC testimonial and endorsement guides require that any endorser, if an endorser says something about the product, it has to reflect their honest beliefs and opinions. Therein lies the road, these CGIs, they, they can't have an honest experience with the product. So before you think about the utility of doing it, it's really important to think about, you know, what kind of claims are you gonna want that influencer to make? What are you gonna want them to say? And is that gonna even be possible? But right. now another, that- Go ahead. Uh, now, I was gonna say now, now that we've gotten you kind of all excited, which was intentional, about all the possibilities of Gen AI, um, we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't want to at least start to highlight some of the risks. Um, so, Sarah, why don't you? Oh, I'm sorry, it's Nicole. 
Let me turn that over. I feel like we can all jump in on this one, but yeah. please take it away. So, totally fine. Sarah is welcome to that. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things on this list. There's a lot of things, a lot more things that aren't even on this list. Um, so to highlight a few of these, uh, the outputs. So whatever the artificial intelligence, your gen AI is sort of spitting out, um, the image, the text, the whatever you're creating, do you own that? What kind of rights do you have to that? That is an ongoing um, question that I anticipate we'll see a lot of litigation around um, still to come in terms of like what, what can you copyright and trademark from, from AI. Uh, data access and data sharing, uh, the fact that data that goes into these um, AI development tools into these large language models can be really difficult to remove. So you really wanna make sure that whatever you're putting in is something that you're comfortable sharing that you feel like you have proper protections for. Um, the accuracy verification and hallucination. So these are all kind of fun uh, in different ways. Uh, the hallucinations have been getting a lot of focus. We're gonna talk a bit more about those. But at a high level, this is just the fact that not everything that comes out will be accurate. Uh, you need to verify that. And sometimes the AI tool will tell you things that seem like facts but are in fact not true and not real uh, in any way, which is sort of the simple way of explaining what an AI hallucination is. Um, there can be biases that can be based on your input on the language, the model used to train the AI that they, they can exist. It's worth knowing that they can exist. Um, and they can end up resulting in things like discriminatory marketing campaigns, for instance, if you're relying on certain elements of a data set to determine where you're going to market. Uh, misuses of the model. Uh, a lot of things that can't be explained. Uh, this is something we run into because there are a lot of laws now that require certain types of explainability in your systems. And how do you handle that? Who has liability if the system goes haywire and does, you know, not terrible things like going out and killing people, but there are a lot of really terrible things that these systems could do if they are um, you know, sort of misconfigured that can have actual sort of legal impacts on people. Uh, security, un unclear safeguards, the unclear um, legal landscape, that's still changing. We just, just yesterday had the AI Act passed finally in the EU. Uh, so we do have a, a little bit more settled uh, legal landscape, but there's you know sort of a lot going on there. To return to this sort of hallucination thing, though, and if you want to go to the next slide, Linda, we can sort of let Lee and Sarah hop in on this too. These are just some some recent headlines on uh, on the sorts of things that have been happening in this space. Um, I, in particular, had been following uh, the Gemini issues with historical inaccuracies. Basically, what happened is if you put in um, some sort of a prompt asking for an image that showed, you know, George Washington in the boat on crossing the Delaware. I think it was. See how well I know my history. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, it would come back and George Washington was crossing the Delaware in a boat and that was all fine, but it was a very diverse crowd of people on the boat. Um, and so that has gotten a, a lot of press and, Google actually paused that feature within Gemini to take account of that. I don't know, Sarah and Lee, if you want to point out some favorites of yours. Yeah, I mean, these are all great examples, Nicole. Personally, I did a test of a client solution, and it told me that it was giving me a poem uh, by a well-known author but I'd never heard of that poem and, and double checked to see, did this really exist? And it didn't. So I said, hmm, I don't think you're right. And it asserted again that it was giving me a correct poem. Finally, I said, this does not seem to be his poem. I can't find a reference. And it said, oh, you're right. I apologize. I fabricated this information. It was just for fun. So very interesting that it responded in that way, first trying to support the fact that it believed in its response and then saying, okay, you got me, I'm just having some fun here. But if you think about that in terms of the definitions, right? It's intended to create new output and it's really meant to be stochastic. So getting different responses to a similar question is a standard thing that it's supposed to do. It's not working incorrectly 
And that also adds to some of the risk component. Yeah, Linda, I, I was going to say that, well, you know, I don't think most of the people on this call are going out to build large language models. Um, I, I, I think one of the things we just want to highlight is, is certainly a lot of advertisers are, you know, and, and content creators in general are starting to experiment with the use of AI um, to help in the creative process. And um, that, is, you know, we're already seeing lots of examples where um, either you're getting output that raises, you know, intellectual property rights. So, you know, potentially you 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 use Chat GPT to help you pr you provide something to your customer to your client, and it turns out that it's plagiarized or it's inaccurate. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later about some of the uh, problems that have happened with chatbots in in terms of um, class action litigation, but again, for example, if you're using a chatbot and you've got lots of different offers, you don't update your chatbot, your chatbot you know, may start to give the customer incorrect information. So- That um, happened with Canadian Air, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so those are just you know, a, a few, I think, sort of day-to-day -day examples of how I think lots of our members are using it now and, and a need for caution as well as uh, and we'll touch on this, it, you know, if, if you're getting data from vendors to train your own internal models, you're going to want to really look at how accurate um, that data is as well. So it's it's great opportunity, but not a panacea. Right, right. And I, I had seen one other example that I thought was interesting, which was related to copywriting for a food product where... I was playing with the tool, asking it to give me a nice product description. And I said, you know, make this appeal to people who want a nutritious breakfast. And it went down the road where eventually it was making health claims that, that wouldn't have been substantiated, right? Around high fiber, low sugar. Uh, to be fair, I was leading the tool a little bit um, to see how far it would go. But just because you've you know you've given it instructions doesn't mean it's going to follow orders and i think generally we're used to technology um doing what we tell it to do um and we're in a new new world with generative ai yeah and and as this slide shows also if you're letting your employees um use open ai make sure um they're not providing as as input anything that might be either your own proprietary information or a client's proprietary information, because then it could end up in, as somebody else's output. Right, right. That's a, a comment there, Linda. You know, people have said, well, if, if we upload information and it says on the site that it's private and secure, then we can trust it, right? No, not necessarily, unless you've done that diligence to understand where the information is actually moving to and from. And the other thing about that is there's absolutely no way at this time for the language model to forget your information. So it, it could spit it out in whole or in part at any time into infinity if you upload something inadvertently. Right, and just to add to that, I, another tip I would say, in addition to never providing confidential information in your prompts and in your input, I would be reluctant to include the brand name that you're working on because that will be ingested and you could end up in a pretty in an echo chamber of output pretty quickly. So if you are trying to copyright, I would only use the generic example of what you're focused on and, and not put in yours or your client's brand. Yeah, and and the only other thing I would I would add here, I'm, Nicole's already talked up about some of these IP issues, um, but sort of related to this, there's there's sort of a growing sensitivity among regulators, and we're going to talk about regulators more in a minute. But if you're going to be using data collected from your your customers, visitors to your website, and, and you're going to be using that for your own internal training models or, you know, 
putting it into even larger language models to get some output from that. You really need to think about getting permission for that because once it's in these models, you can't really control where it's going to go. And so it's really becoming it's really becoming increasingly important, just as you used to think about getting consent for really sensitive personal data, that customer consumers aren't thinking about this when they're sharing certain data with you. So if you're going to use it in this way, the regulators are expending are expecting much more transparency. And in addition to that, um, you know, just just some other concerns, um, you know, the FTC has, as it has done in many of the tech uh, areas, it has kind of made itself the self-appointed watchdog for the moment. Um, unlike the EU, we don't really have um, legislation yet, but they are some of the concerns, they're very concerned about unintended bias and discriminatory outcomes, even, even if it's, again, um, it, it's all well-meaning. For example, if you were trying to use, you know, AI to determine how to do some dynamic pricing in and of itself, that's okay. But if it turns out that certain more protected classes of consumers are getting, you know, higher prices or less favorable credit offers or things like that, um, then that's something that the FTC is going to be really concerned about. They're very concerned, and in fact, they have a rulemaking proceeding right now about um, the use of AI for uh, for deep fakes and imposters. Um, they just passed a trade regulation rule prohibiting impersonation of companies and organizations, and they've just proposed to amend that rule. Um, to include individuals as well. And they're particularly concerned about this coming up um, on an election cycle. And, um, and any, any of you want to weigh in on some of these others? Well, I'll leave it maybe tag on to what you said there, Linda. With unintended bias, one of the things that we see is that companies will develop something that is a great application for the purpose for which it was built. And then they'll get a great idea that there's another way that they could use this uh, language model based application. And unfortunately, it hasn't been tested to see if the model will produce unintended results for that use case. And that's one of the slippery slope areas where we see um, this unintended bias or unintended result create huge risk for companies. Yeah, one of the other. Um Sorry. One of the other um, things that's interesting that I think is, you know, particularly interesting for for our members is the FTC has actually issued some very specific warnings to marketers. And one of the things um, that they've talked about are, you know, companies that are actually beginning to make marketing claims based on their use of AI. In other words, you know, our our you know, security systems are better than our competitors because they're AI trained or, you know, our, you know, heating and cooling systems are better than our competitors because they're AI trained. And you can't assume, and I think we're going to see this increasingly um, in, in advertising for products or services, that companies are going to rely on the fact that they've got, you know, that the products are now incorporating or being based on certain AI models to assume that they must be better at what they do than products um, that aren't based on AI. And basically the FTC has come out and said, no, 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 um, you can't assume that. You would have to test your product against a competitive product the same way um, you've always had to do. This is not a proxy for because it's based on some AI model it's necessarily better. And the other one I want to highlight, again, it ties into what we talked about in terms of getting consent from, from consumers to use their data for a, you know, to train models. If you have to think about if the consumer now wants to delete or opt out of your use of that data, 
um, you may not be able to delete it um, in the sense that training on the model has already occurred, but you may have to delete that data for purposes of future training. So uh, all, the whole area of consent and how are you going to treat opt-out requests um, when the data you're getting is, gonna, is being used to train AI models is something you really have to think about before you, you kind of start to do this. And again, anyone, any, Sarah, Lee, Nicole, anything else you want to mention here? I think you got the, the good high points. <laughs> okay. Um, so, again, we, you know, um, just, you know, some of the practical risks. Um, Nicole, maybe you want to start us off on how you can mitigate some of these risks. Sure. I think I think probably the biggest one is just knowing what you're trying to do. Uh, we get <laughs> we get a lot of calls from a lot of clients just asking, "We're going to use AI." It's like, what what are you doing with it <laughs> um, exactly? And you know, are you, are you putting your own data in it? Are you just using right. somebody else? Like, really knowing what you're doing, um, having some sort of AI panel, AI task force, AI team that you know, your sort of AI brain trust, whatever you want to call them, that you can bounce ideas around and off of. Um, they're going to bring a diversity of opinions and a diversity of thoughts, really, from different areas. So, yes, legal, but, you know, it's nice to have somebody from your data or your marketing team there that is really thinking through, like, how can this be, uh, you know, practically useful in IT? What, you know, how is this going to change anything from your security perspective? So um, also, I think just knowing that this is not like some policies where you can write the policy and review it every five years, <laughs> it's going to be a policy that you write for what you're doing now, and it gets revisited as things change, as you develop different tools, as you use things. And you may need a policy that, that sort of drives the way that your company um, sort of engages with AI tools, engages these vendors, as well as one for your employees on what use they can make of them within the workplace. And then human oversight, just because you're using AI, a lot of you have processes in place already to you know, run your trademark reviews, to run you know, all sorts of these. They should all stay in place. Right, <laughs> common sense review, absolutely. Like humans matter, stay involved, ask questions, dig in. Um, don't be afraid to, to raise the practical questions. And then to, to add to that, the final point there, partner with agencies and vendors. I think it's important to have a conversation with those you know, partners and, and vendors in your ecosystem and say, um, how are you using AI tools? How does that impact me? When you want to use AI tools in a deliverable for one of your clients, um, think it through and have that conversation so that, you know, I like to say the first time it comes up probably shouldn't be in an exchange of paper where you're refusing to indemnify and they're asking you to or the other way around. So I want to move on a little bit. Just I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of the time and we don't want to spend all of the time talking broadly about Gen AI, Gen AI, but there are a couple of other ways which I know are really, you know, essential tools for the direct response um, business and performance-driven marketing, and 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 so we want to. I want to touch on a few of those um, and talk first about um, targeted advertising, and obviously targeted you know, the algorithms used for targeted advertising. Um, that's been one of the major, major applications. Um, we talked about bias before, and that becomes a particularly sensitive issue if you're, you know, doing anything with housing, with job opportunities, with credit offers, with health-related products. Um, even some of the dating sites, um, the FTC is starting to look at the algorithms that they're using and, you know, any kind of financial services. Those are always going to be considered um, very high risk areas. But I, I, I do want to mention that, you know, apart from the fact that targeted advertising is 
very heavily reliant on AI. The FTC just doesn't like it. And we're starting to see signs of that in, in lots of ways. Um, you know, we, we often put our pulse on what the FTC is thinking by reading consent orders and kind of reading what happened to lots of other companies that have gotten into trouble. And some of what we've seen recently, I, I would say, are like little private attacks on targeted um, advertising, for example, in, in some of their recent consent orders, uh, most recently in one they brought against Better Health, which is that online therapy service. They're actually prohibiting the use of any health data. They're banning it for targeted advertising. And then there was a, a second one against GoodRx where they also prohibited you know, sharing of health information or any sensitive information for targeted advertising. And when you start to see these bans, uh, you know, basically the FTC is saying, even if the consumer was fine with it and gave you their consent, we don't want to see you use it. That's a that's a signal to us that the FTC is not a fan of targeted advertising. And so what I think is important um, in this space, again, is to really be um, attentive to bias, really be attentive to making sure you have appropriate consents to use sensitive data for targeted advertising. And um, ladies, uh, anyone else want to chime in on that? Again, I think um, if you're using an agency to do your targeted advertising for you, to go ahead and ask about it and um, make sure that the data sets that go into that algorithm for the targeting purposes, you know, make sense and aren't inherently um, slanted as well. So. And, and then there are some other, um, uh, you know, again, some other technologies, you know, some some built on on AI more than others, but technologies in their own right um, that we did want to touch on because they are um, a target, a massive target of class action litigation. So Nicole, maybe you could walk us through these and 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 what um, our viewers and listeners can do to try to mitigate some of the risk here. Because these sure. are- so a, a lot of this, I think, um, kind of comes back to transparency and letting people know uh, what you are doing in clear ways that are going to make sense to them. Um, one of the sort of strategies that we're seeing both on the uh, chatbot cases and the session replay cases are coming under the um, the two-party consent states for recording under the wiretapping statute. So these are not, although they are at their core in some ways, privacy issues. They are coming under laws that have the private right of action so that people can actually bring them as, as, as suits. So, so we are seeing, for instance, in those types of technologies like Session Replay, which can track, for instance, how your mouse moves around the screen, um, and the chatbot cases where you can interact with either a human or an AI tool, uh, AI chatbot, um, and that can be recorded. Um, and actually, I will say I prefer when it's recorded because then I can get the whole the whole discussion at the end and know what was discussed. Um, I actually think that's a very valuable thing, but that some people were not aware of that. And in states that require two party, both parties to consent to the recording, you have to be able to give particular um, uh, notices or uh, other information about what's being recorded so that somebody knows and can properly um, opt into that. Uh, the Metapixel cases are coming under a number of different different Sort of Nicole, theory. can you just yeah. explain, because I think a lot of times companies don't even know that mm -hmm. they're doing this because it's so on the back end what the session replay and the Metapixel cases are about. Yes, yeah, so the session replay cookies, um, they're, they are often used, and a lot of companies will tell you that they use them for um, finding glitches in their, in their website or security issues. But what they can do is record. So if I go to a website and I'm moving my mouse around and I hover over, you know, say say it's um, retail and I'm looking at, you know, 
page. It's got 12 dresses. I can see them all. And I am going over and I hover over one dress for like 30 seconds. I look at some others. And then I come back to that same dress and hover over it for 30 seconds. It will record all of my mouse movements and those can be played back. Now, even those, those, the, um, the session replay cookies are intended for other purposes. You, you can actually derive a lot of information from them from a marketing purpose as well. Right. Like what, which, which thing did you want to click on the fir that first, for example? Yeah. Like what, what were you drawing? Did click, what did yeah. you skip? Yeah. Yeah. Or did I click into something and then immediately click back out of it? it was like, no. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that type of thing. Um, so you can derive a lot of information and because they're recorded, they stick around like there's no guarantee that that information is being deleted um, and uh, similarly with some metapixel uh, the big issue with the metapixel cases uh, a lot of them is that if you visit a website that uses the metapixel which is a tracking pixel it just tracks when somebody arrives at the website if you are logged into your Facebook your Instagram anything else owned by meta at the time that, that that you go to that website that has the metapixel, it can suddenly like link up all sorts of information from from your profile to you know the information they're getting. So Meta ends up knowing where all you might have gone, and the company can actually also at times derive a little more information. So there is concern about the sort of profiling aspect there. And then um, chatbot cases are just you know realistically they've come out of this idea that not everybody realizes they're recorded. But now we're also seeing not everybody also knows that they're talking to a real person or not a real person, which is a separate concern. So, so that's kind of where we're seeing a lot of it. There's a lot to be sort of sorted out in the litigation space, um, but a lot going on with the types of tracking technologies that companies are using to try to derive information from from and about people. Yeah, and I, I was just going to add that like this is a this is really bad news because there are so many of these cases and case and the courts are deciding them lots of different ways. But the really good news is like these are easily avoidable if you just put some notice and some acknowledgement um, before you have the interaction with the consumer. At least you're not you're not going to be the one they're going to go after they could always argue about whether the notice and consent was sufficient but right. they're going after the ones that have no notice and not even an effort to you know obtain some acknowledgement from the consumer so there's often, a soft target right um, yeah there's often account settings as well that you can tweak to make everything a little bit more compliant although also makes your data a little bit harder to use when you do that right so I think the, the last thing we wanted to talk about, um, and we know this is really a, a big one um, for this group, is attribution. Um, and that raises some questions or, you know, is raising some legal issues as well. Um, and I, I, Nicole, I know you've been involved with this one a fair amount. So. Yeah, and I, uh, Sarah has too. She got dragged into my my attribution stuff. <laughs> so I, um, I just think one of the interesting things that's going on with attribution right now are, are some of the ways in which it is finding itself in the privacy law world. Um, and it has to do with whether the data that you are getting as part of whatever you're using for your attribution is considered personal data or not. And that definition seems to be constantly getting broader. Um, so, for instance, we've known for a long time that things like IP addresses, device identifiers, et cetera, are generally considered personal data, other things less so. Just recently, we had a decision out of the European Union that found that, for instance, the, uh, the consent strings that are used by the IAB for the transparency and consent framework are now considered personal data as well. So, there are lots of things um, out there that are now being sort of there are things that you may have at one point in time thought of as sort of a loose piece of data um, that are now able to be attributed to someone, or if you have enough other pieces of data about that person, easier to be tied to them, which makes them personal data, which then means you're in the realm of some of the issues that we're running into on the privacy front in terms of things like opt-in, opt-out, the consent framework, all of this kind of stuff. So those are just, things to sort of highlight and be potentially thinking about when you are looking at how are you working with attribution. And the other piece of it is that we often find that companies are moving toward 
um, using first party data is sometimes a little more easily used than third party data, especially if what you're attempting to do with your attribution is to track across websites or to do cross device tracking. Um, that can be a little bit harder because you may be reliant more on third party data that you may have less control of. Terry, you always have the uh, the the nugget of, of practical <laughs> advice here. So, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's important if you build your business model and are compensated or compensating someone around attribution, you really have to think this through because it's going to be trickier to refine those attribution numbers going forward. So when you look at the value proposition and your business model and how attribution fits into that, be be mindful and be forward thinking that those numbers may get fuzzier as the definition of you know personal information increases it may reduce for you um, the clarity of your attribution so think about third party data versus maybe first party data the consents how to do it um, but definitely start with and think about your business model and be mindful about locking it in 100 percent to to one attribution technology is that fair to say nicole yeah i think i mean i think so and i you know it's not to say that attribution cannot be done in the current of privacy course. landscape just that you know there are issues out there that really should be taken into account in in determining what you're doing in the right privacy. and it may cost you more frankly you know to get to a, a more privacy compliant attribution model and so it, it needs to be thought about in that business context as well so I know we're coming up on time. I know Tom, do we have any any questions in the chat? Yeah, yeah, we do have a we do have a couple of questions, and I'd love to to get to them quickly if we can. Um, uh, let me slide back here. Um, great summary. First, a comment apparently. Great summary of the opportunities and risks. Um, as we know, there's a very active regulatory regime right now, as you discussed. Of all the things discussed today, what's most specifically in the crosshairs of the FTC and state regulators right now? Well, the state, uh, so from the privacy regulatory stance, uh, anyway, I would say it's definitely the, the sale of data piece. Like, but on the sort of more sharing side of it, if you think of it that way, if you're used to the CCPA definition, it is the providing of, of data to other parties without um, the appropriate opt-outs. And then um, the, uh, streaming services have been the other big thing lately that we've seen. And I would say data just in general that's not coming in through websites, but that's coming in through apps, streaming services, you know, internet of things, other devices, wearables, that kind of stuff. They're interested in all the ways that other things are collecting data. Right, and I'd say the FTC has its sights squarely on deep fakes, um, voice simulation, lookalikes, things like that. Especially in the lead up to the election this year, I think we're going to see a lot of drive in that space. And I would just add endorsements because they they just updated their endorsement guides, and so um, and they did it specifically to say that. Um, consumer generated endorsers are subject to the rules. So I think they're gonna be looking for one of those cases. Great, great, great. I'll wedge in one more here before we before we uh, wrap up. Um, I'm picking amongst three. So folks, uh, forgive me if I didn't get to yours. If AI goes rogue and offers incorrect, non-sanctioned, unapproved, or even illegal information, and a brand uses some of this info, is the brand fully liable? Or does the AI source, the company that owns the platform, share in some of the liability? Well, I'd take away the if. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the answer is the typical lawyer one. It depends. <laughs> so, Something really interesting related to this, though, is that we are seeing AI products, especially generative AI, hitting the market at a rapid pace. And sales teams are saying, we built our own. We built our own language model. Usually they did not do that. They built something on top of a third party language model, which means if you vetted your um, contractual supplier and you've got terms with them, you may still have open risk because they're really sending your data, your prompt, your information 
to an external third party LLM. And again, that's why you, using AI doesn't divorce anyone of full responsibility. There's there's different there's risk shifting between the parties, but back to Nicole's original answer, it depends. <laughs> great. Well, hey, great, w wonderful uh, job, ladies. Thank you so much for your uh, efforts today. We really appreciate it. I know our audience appreciates it. And I know our YouTube audience, once this goes onto our YouTube channel in the next uh, couple of days, will also appreciate it. We'll be pushing this out uh, probably no later than Monday and we'll have it across our socials. So if you attended today and uh, you wanted someone on your team to see this, no, you can go to our YouTube channel in a couple of days. Uh, thanks again to the speakers and to the Women's Leadership Council for bringing us today's event. If you're and, a PDMI member, well, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna add, um, Tom, if anybody, if we didn't get to your questions and you want to shoot them or Tom can shoot them and we'll get back to you. And I assume you're going to send out the deck with this as well, right? Tom? Yeah, the deck will be in the video. And if you want to send me the deck as well, Linda, I can be able to share that with whoever okay. wants. To and there are some resources in there um, that relate specifically to AI and a lot of what Incubaker has put out. So, um, you know, feel free to consult those as well. Yeah, yep, absolutely. This is, uh, you know, this shows uh, really the power of our Women's Leadership Council, 70 members strong and growing. Linda is the vice chair. Thank you for your work. If you're a PDMI member want to get involved in, in the Women's Council or any of our other six member councils, you can reach out to me today. Your next opportunity to attend a PDMI event live online is next Wednesday, March 20th at 2 o'clock Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. When the Brand Response Council airs its latest episode of Take 20, a look at how marketers in sports and entertainment are using performance methods today. To register, please visit the pdmi.com slash take-20. Finally, online registration can you, continues for PDMI East April 8th through 10th at Eden Rock, Miami Beach. Badges for performance marketers must attend event of the spring are priced at just $395 for PDMI members, $595 for non-members. If you want to stay at the events, host hotel at a deeply discounted rate. You have just a couple hours left. PDMI special room block rate of $329 per night expires later this afternoon. Visit the pdmi.com slash pdmi dash east to get your badge today. Thank you again, ladies. Thank you to our audience. Be Thank well. You. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.